Hey, good to see you. So how about you? <laughs> well, uh, I'll have an interesting little report for all of you about a museum exhibit that I had mentioned to you. But first, let's make sure I admit there's one new person here. Okay. Uh, well, is that museum closed or something? We have a small but dedicated group. But uh, anyway, so first, and as always, I, I before we get to tonight's lecture, which is an important one, because I can guarantee you there will be at least one slide on the slide analysis section on architecture from either tonight's lecture or next week's, because you see we have two weeks on architecture. That's my area of expertise. I, I'm sure I've mentioned this to you, uh, you know, at least the beginning of the semester. And I've had uh, five books uh, published of which three are still in print and they're in your library, both campuses, maybe just the main campus on reserve, but there are also only one there, I'm sorry, there is only one of those books that you will need to do some reading from. And, you know, you might be able to read it. That means you can check on Amazon where it's not even like it's, you know, $22. It's a Julia Morgan book. We're going to talk about her after the, uh, well, tonight, actually, before we finish up. We, we should be able to finish early too tonight. But I think we'll need to take a brief break because there's a, there's a fairly important about uh, background information to some of these architects. I mean, everyone's heard of Frank Lloyd Wright, right? But I bet you don't know some of the juicier details about his life that affected his designing and his style of architecture and his career. Uh, and also, I've learned a lot more about the women that worked in his office. And he was not exactly known as a women's rights supporter. <laughs> in fact, some would just say, say he was flat out sexist. He wasn't misogynist. I mean, he had, you know, good relationships with a number of uh, his uh, female assistants, they were his associates, they called them, out of 30 some, I think he had three or four that were women, uh, maybe more over the entire, he, he, he was an architect for over 30, 60 years. So he would have sometimes as many as 30 people working in his office, but usually not that many. Julia Morgan is another one who deserves a little more background information. When we get to, we have two slides you notice from the syllabus about her work. And the point is that some of these sites, you can go out to extra get extra credit by going out to them because there's several of them right here in, well, actually in the North Bay. There's four Julie Morgan houses in Petaluma and they're all easily uh, photographical. <laughs> photographable, boy, is that a word? Photographable, there we go. I mean, you can get a photo of them from the streets. You know, you can't take pictures of someone's house when you're on their property without their permission. Everyone should know that. I've only ever had one or two students get in trouble for doing that over the years for extra credit or for a paper. I mean, uh, if you haven't finished your second paper, her homes, four homes, they're all, no two are alike in San, in, um, sorry, I meant Petaluma, not Santa Rosa. She did the chapel chimes in Santa Rosa, which is also easily accessible because that's open to the public. So you could even go inside that one. Anyway, we'll get to all that in a few minutes. Has anybody here been to the Frida Kahlo exhibit? Let me go ahead and uh, do the, yeah, because it's already too late. But the reason I am um, bringing it up, oh man, I hate things like this. My daughter and I went on Sunday. It was the last day it was open. I had had tickets for it in December and then they shut down all the museums. If you recall from the you know last winter surge, we just survived and reopened them recently. So two things. One is relevant to any of you who plan to do extra credit by going to a museum between now and final exams week, which is an option for 10 points. I'd like you to try and keep it to no more than two of the same options. That's 20 points in any given category. So for instance, two museums, two architecture sites, uh, and maybe one or two films or four articles, four articles, five points each, that's 20 points. Or one of my novels, that's 15 points. Um, Anyway, the point is, uh, uh, if you plan to go to a Bay or Art Museum, you should be aware of a couple of things. Uh, we found out the hard way. We knew that, that they uh, had mass requirements. That wasn't an issue. And they said they were going to socially distance. No way. The, I'd seen it. I've rarely seen this was at the de Young now. The de Young has an exhibit you might want to see that goes all the way through till final exams week. So it's an option for you for 10 points. It's called... Uh, Calder or Picasso Calder. They give Picasso the top billing. Calder was the greatest sculptor of the American sculptor of the 20th century. Amazing man. He invented the uh, mobile, the stabile, wire sculpture, all kinds of other unique forms of metal sculpture that we now take for granted. He invented those things, one person. 
Um, and he was, uh, you know, well recognized during his lifetime. There, there's documentaries on or books uh, on him. I mean, and books on him. So that exhibit's worth going to. But be aware, I don't see any social distancing. Nobody was paying any attention to any of that. And my daughter has had one shot. I've had both my Pfizer shots. She was a little uncomfortable toward the end. The other thing is you didn't miss much. If you didn't go and you were even thinking of it, it's now it's too late because they, they just closed it on Sunday. Was it come on? I think it was misleading to me when you have, you know, only three paintings of hers that were not small little self-portraits just of her face and none of her famous paintings that are in the textbooks or most art history syllabuses. Uh, they only had one painting that was even well known and it was already owned by the museum. So th that was misleading. I, I, I don't like that when that happens. They did the same thing with Tut. Somebody went to see the Tut exhibit a few years ago at the De Young. You know, tell us the truth. You're not going to have the main works there. Then we can decide is it worth all that, you know, 35 bucks a person per t ticket, A, and, and you know, uh, having to RSVP well in advance and waiting, you know, to get in and then finding out that most of it was photographs. It was all black and white photographs. Her father was a really talented uh, photographer. So those were mildly interesting, but after about the 20th or 30th one of people that had very little to do with her, you know, her cousins and her, you know, that's what called filler. So all they had was a half dozen self portraits, none of which were the famous ones, you know, the thorn like this, everyone's seen that one. If you've seen any Frida Kahlo's cell portrait with thorn necklace, not there, should have been. Um, the two Fridas, not there. Uh, cell portrait with Diego uh, on my chest or on my heart, if you get the second part, where it's a very famous image of her after he had betrayed her with her sister. You know the story, some of you, I know, because some of you wrote papers about her paintings and, and, and her, that, that incident where she walked in on her husband and her sister in bed, in their own bedroom. Yeah, that led to a divorce, but they got back together. So it's, it, of course, it's an interesting story and that you could read, you know, at home or online, wherever. Uh, it really was, I mean, I'm glad I went so I could see what it was like and, and report back to everybody. But now it's a moot point. They were thinking of extending it till June, but they're not going to. So there are other museum exhibits all over the Bay Area though that are worth 10 points if you just show me the, as many of you have already done. Uh, the the proof that you attended, you don't have to write anything, uh, just your name and the class that you're in. Okay, uh, and the other thing is about the architecture options. Now people can go inside buildings. So if you prefer, you can do this. I should send you another email. I'm just overwhelmed right now with all the, just did my income taxes. I barely finished that in time to get segue into this class. Bottom line about uh, your your architecture options. Uh, it used to be I required you to go to one site only, which that's easier than going to four different ones, but you had to go inside the building and sh uh, take three photos or details of the interior and one of the exterior. So you can do that now, again, if you want to. That's, a, that's still an option. Or you can just go to four other separate buildings for uh, independent sites and take photos of the exterior. But if you do that, you'll need to just write the addresses of the buildings. You don't have to write anything about the history or the architect. That's worth 10 points. Okay, so um, anybody have any questions about um, anything relating to extra credit? Uh, or if you haven't finished your, your second papers, you still have time, but it, it does go up to 10 points after. I think, I, yeah, I know I said this, so I'll say it again. It'll only be five points off if I get any late papers from this class uh, before, I'll call it, say, 2 a.m., which is the early morning hours in essence overnight. So that if I see in the morning when I first log on uh, any late papers from anyone in this class, the other classes deadline was two weeks earlier. So they're past this point. It'll only be five points off. You never know five points difference because they'll go up to 10 after that. 10 points off versus five could make the difference between an A and a B in this or class or uh, a B and a C, whatever. So keep that in mind. If you if you've been working on a paper and you didn't finish it, but you think you can finish it in the next you know eight or nine hours, well, whatever, few hours between now and the you know early a.m. hours, I, I won't count it uh, a whole week or ten points off, just five points off if I see it in the morning when I log on to uh, my email account. And remember, it goes to AOL, Mark W. AOL. Okay. Any questions about anything relating to grades, extra credit, uh, museum exhibits? 
Anybody want to report anything interesting that they've seen in terms of a museum site or uh, any other kind of uh, recent event in the art world? Okay. All right, let's segue now to architecture of the 20th century. That's it's basically everything tonight is, but as you, some of you may have noticed, I hope with the syllabus being in front of you, that I start out with buildings from the late 18th, uh, sorry, late 19th century, the late 1800s. Here's the thing, the first two, we're gonna see them next week, uh, but let's just do it as a segue. It'll probably be at the start of next week's lecture, although it might be at the, you know, after the break, because those are in a different file and I don't wanna go back and forth two or three different times. It slows things down and, you know, you guys don't wanna to have to sit there while I switch files back and forth. So these tonight are all American architecture and almost all of them are 20th century, but we're gonna start with the building from the 1800s. And it's the uh, first uh, skyscraper designed outside of Chicago. And some of you might think, what, wait a minute, didn't New York invent the skyscraper? Well, we're gonna talk about that, no. The birthplace of the skyscraper is my, you know, birthplace, my hometown, Chicago. The first skyscrapers in New York were a good 15, 20 years after the first ones in, or at least 10 years after the first ones in Chicago. So the one in St. Louis that we're going to start with tonight in just a moment, that is older than any skyscraper in New York City and it's intact. It's still there. I've, I've been inside it, beautifully restored, and luckily it's financially feasible. Uh, it's, you know, it's a functioning office building as it was designed to be originally over 130 years ago. In fact, exactly 130 years ago. So we're going to start with early skyscrapers and define that. There's a member in your list of handouts. There are some terms to know, and uh, those would be um, skyscrapers. Well, we'll talk about that when we get to the five main schools of, design, of uh, 20th century architecture. And those aren't going to be remembered. They'll be the true false. Any definition that pops up by itself is a stated, you know, true or false is this, you know, uh, the way this definition should be. You've all covered that when you wrote your answers to the true false section on the midterm. So the final is the same format exactly. And it's not cumulative. I think everyone knows that, but I know some people still aren't clear. We don't go back to everything that we covered before the midterm, just everything after that. Okay, so let's get to our first screen share here. Or in our first must know slide. Uh, and let's do three things. Let's get this out of the way. And then let's maximize the image so you can see it better. Okay, everybody see this now, I hope. Okay, there are, um, let, me, let me do the count. Let's three slides, that's not that many out of the total tonight, that are so important that we are, uh, I am not gonna cut them from the study list. The others, you know, like I've said before, might or might not be cut. We'll do the review the week before, exactly one week before. Okay, all right, here we go, good timing. Okay, good timing. Yeah, uh, we're just getting started with the first slide. All right. Somebody's got a reverb. <laughs> Sounds like my brother's rock and roll band <laughs> microphone. Yeah, I had a brother. He's homeless now, by choice. And he he uh, he had a rock and roll band in the seventies that actually played at some major venues. The Whiskey a Go Go. If you don't know where that is, Sunset Boulevard, LA. Uh, <clears throat> never never got past that phase, but <laughs> better than a garage band. Anyway, we're not going to look at reverb things now. We are going to talk about. This as a very important building. It's a National Historic Landmark, and it's one of the oldest skyscrapers it is still standing in the United States. So here we go, our first must know. The architect's name was Sullivan, S-U-L-L-I-V-A-N. And the name of the building is just uh, two words, Wainwright, that's one word, I'll spell it, Wainwright Building, W-A-I-N-W-R-I-G-H-T, 1891. So what are we looking at? We're looking at, I'll start again with the facts in the order of importance. It is one of the oldest remaining skyscrapers in the United States. And it is the oldest skyscraper that's intact, meaning exactly the way it was designed, right? 
that's the word they usually use, or the other word is extant, that pretty much the same thing. You can use either word if it's on the final essay part. Uh, it is uh, the oldest intact, we'll just keep it to that word, a skyscraper uh, outside of Chicago. And when I say that, it's because skyscrapers were invented in Chicago, and that's a fact that's relevant to this one. How could it be? It's not in Chicago. St. Louis is hundreds of miles from Chicago. Well, here's why. Sullivan was a Chicago architect, and he's not now correctly called, some people used to incorrectly label uh, Sullivan, right? as his name was Lewis, by the way, Lewis Sullivan as the father of the skyscraper. No, that's not correct. He didn't design the first skyscraper. He, there's too much background detail. I will not go there, but you could look it up. The first skyscraper was in Chicago in 1884. But Sullivan, here's how to describe him in a, one or two lines, obviously who he was, important part of this slide. He's considered uh, the um, perfecter, right? of the modern skyscraper, the one who perfected this design system. And it was called the Chicago School of Design. Now, some people think, oh, it's where classes were held. No, not that kind of school, of course, but a group of architects, early Chicago skyscraper architects. Sullivan was the most famous American architect, period. No qualification. In the whole country, he was the best known American architect during his early years. And later, he hired a young man named Frank Lloyd Wright, trained him, and then Wright took off with half his clients and opened his own office, and they never spoke again. But before Wright did that, before Wright became more famous than Sullivan, Sullivan's name was a household, uh, household word. People knew who he was because he was popular. He was a good lecturer. Uh, he had a colorful personal life. <laughs> Should be a movie about him, actually. And he was one of the first designers of skyscrapers. So he didn't invent the skyscraper. I'll go ahead and tell you the name of the guy, but you don't have to write this or remember it. William LeBaron Jenny. He's in almost any good book about the history of early skyscrapers. So just say the first skyscraper was in Chicago in the 1880s. So by the time Sullivan designed this building, he had already designed a half a dozen skyscrapers. You could just say, you know, several skyscrapers in Chicago and become the most famous American architect. So because he perfected this system of design, and we're gonna define the other part of the meaning here, which is, well, what does that mean? So here's a definition of a skyscraper. And that's part of the meaning on this slide if it's on the exam. So, and I said, I won't cut it, it's, it's too important. So you should write the definition within the notes on the meaning, okay, of this slide. The skyscraper ha is, a, is a, a building with three features, okay? A building with three features, 10, number one, 10 or more stories, okay? Number two, an electric elevator <laughs> and number three, an internal metal skeleton. Number three is the most important because that's what made it possible to build these skyscrapers in the first place. There had been six, seven, even eight story tall buildings in, well, some in Chicago, quite a few actually, but even more in New York before the first skyscraper. So how to get higher than that, it was necessary in order, I should say, to get a building that's more than about eight stories uh, that can function, that, that people will go to work in or live in on the top floors. You had to have two things that were, and this building has both precursors or, or prerequisites. There we go, I meant prerequisites, requirements for a building. I just gave you the list of it, maybe to repeat that, right? So to get past eight stories, for people to want to live or work in such a building of 10 or more stories, they needed electric elevators. Nobody's gonna climb up 10 flights of stairs every day several times a day, right? Uh, so ten, it had to have electric elevators. First one was invented by no coincidence in the early 1880s. So that sets the stage for these 10 story early skyscrapers. And this one is two 10 stories. You can see if you're looking at it, counting them. The other thing is the internal metal framework because that is so much stronger than any method of architectural construction ever developed anywhere on earth before that. And it was Chicago architects and engineers who came up with that idea. You know, it used to be the big steel mill city. There are hardly any steel mills left in Chicago, I'm sure now, but they were all over when I was growing up, polluting the sky. But, but without those, you know, steel girders and beams 
constructing a framework, some say a cage, like a metal cage, but it's inside the building that then makes it possible to make the exterior walls, these light open, may not seem like it to you because modern skyscrapers are all glass and steel, aren't they, for most of them. But look at this, this building and compare it to any other Victorian uh, building that you'll ever see or have seen pictures of or in a movie or when you travel, you'll see what I mean. This is much more light and open. The area of window space to wall space is at least half and half. You know, and that wouldn't have been possible. They call these curtain walls. You don't have to know that phrase, but that's the phrase the architects use to describe this new method. But the overall term for this kind of design with the, the skyscrapers, I just gave you the definition, buildings with all three of those features, first invented in Chicago is just called capital C, capital S, two words, Chicago School. And that's what these were, the earliest skyscrapers. They had brick, this is in case not obvious, we'll do the form analysis in just a couple of minutes. Brick uh, facing, right, brick, brick exterior walls. But inside it's got uh, metal and that metal is in framing, which everyone's seen these buildings under construction, right? I mean, don't even have to have gone into San Francisco. There's still more, every time I go in, there's several more. Under construction, right? They, and sometime in downtown Oakland, I don't think they're gonna have any more in Santa Rosa, right? We only have a couple there in downtown Santa Rosa, but, but people have seen these at some point in, in anyone's adult life. You've seen a building like this under construction. Same method used now for over 140 years. Well, close to it. Uh, the first skyscraper again was 1884 to be exact. It was completed that year in Chicago. So the, the same technology is used. Now, this is a sidebar, but I'll bet it'll be interesting enough for you that you may somebody want to write it as part of the meaning of this slide. Ah, but what about the Twin Towers, 9-11, New York? You may, a couple of you have thought that far ahead and said, yeah, those are not internal. Those were, sorry, they're not there anymore, obviously. But when they were standing for that 40 plus years, they were an exception to this rule. They had an external metal framework. And the only reason that worked is because of the relative strength of the exterior skeleton and the fact that there was two engineers who they weren't even architects they were japanese engineers that designed those two buildings and they made the the, the each floor the load it's called the weight of each floor much lighter than most other you know 50 60 was well, 100 stories right the, both towers were 100 stories i think one's 110 yeah so anyway the point is that that those buildings are an exception and if you're curious about this, I understand conspiracy theories just keep going and going and, you know, sometimes they have a basis, but this one doesn't, that it might have been an inside job, right? I've heard that one. We had this discussion in my classes at, at Santa Rosa JC within a week after the incident, the 9-11 incident. Could it have been somebody planning something inside the building? No, because the architects said exactly what was going to happen to those buildings. And they said, we don't advise you using an exterior metal skeleton. It's cheaper and faster to finish those two behemoths. They were both over 1,400 store, uh, feet, sorry, tall, right? 1,300, sorry, feet tall. Taller than the Empire State Building, both of them. And if you want them to be built quicker and more cheaply, we can use the outside, but we don't recommend it. And, and when they were asked why, this is all on video that's been taped, that, that, no guesswork here. These two Japanese architects spoke flawless English visiting in New York City when they were given the commission. They said, because if a jet airplane full of fuel was to take off of a New York or nearby airport in any you know city in the near region but around New York City and crash into them, they would literally implode because of the exoskeleton trapping all the heat from that fuel and the fires that it would generate would eventually weaken and collapse the framework. What was inside was not as strong as the usual skyscrapers. So they even recommended not doing that, but that's what the architectural board in New York City, whatever they call themselves, agreed is they wanted the uh, exoskeleton. And you see what happened. <clears throat> so very few buildings now are, are, are built uh, you know, with, with anything other than if there's high rises or skyscrapers. Uh, the internal metal skeleton is much stronger and much safer. And a proof of that is the, is the Empire State Building. If you don't know this, some of you, I bet you do. 1945, end of World War II, just before the end of the war, a Japanese, sorry, I'll, I'll be all right. Let me say, a B, I think it was 17, yes, it was, a B-17, the biggest bomber we had that was used to bomb Japan and Germany during the, the war. 
uh, with a full crew on board crashed into the Empire State Building on the 80th floor. And it barely shook that building. It definitely damaged that floor because the entire plane fell apart. Pieces of it went through the windows and some of a went up a fireball because it was loaded with fuel. It had just taken off from some military base. And it killed all the people on the plane. No one was in the building because it was 5 a.m. in the morning on like a Sunday. Some people died on the ground. I think two or three people happened to be walking on the sidewalk. So a disaster was averted there because the Empire State Building, of course, has an internal metal skeleton, like 99.5% of all skyscrapers. Okay, so let's now do uh, the formal analysis. It's a warm color, beautiful red brick. I, at least I like that color. I grew up with buildings like this all around me and my neighborhood. And then we have the rhythm of the windows we've already seen, but there's also these, uh, you can call them you know, pillars or piers is the right word, piers. The other word is pylons, like P-Y-L-O-N-S, or piers, not as the kind that goes in the water, but the structural kind. Because inside this is, you know, it, it, inside the walls, this is a decorative feature that shell sort of encases, is the right word, the metal framework uh, that you, you would see if you saw it under construction. So those create rhythm, the piers the windows and then up here is nice rhythm. That's typical Sullivan. He liked to use decorations on the upper uh, floors of his buildings. By the way, he had two mottos and you could use either one or both of these uh, as part of the meaning if this is on the final. Uh, he said uh, a, a, uh, a building should have something to delight the eye of the beholder. And he never did a plain skyscraper, a pure functional architecture we see like for instance, these two buildings look here. Typical modern skyscrapers, not very much imagination, variety, decorative detail, forget it. Of course, it's, you know, not used much anymore in a few places. So he always had some kind of decorative detail, either at the top or bottom of the building, so usually both. In this case, he just used it on the top story, right? Oh, that metal work, that grill work. Okay, so something to delight the eye of the beholder, all, all buildings should have, he felt. And the second thing he said is, um, um, <clears throat> Form follows function. You probably heard that phrase for a lot of different types of design, right? Not just architecture. It's a very common, almost cliche phrase now. He didn't coin it, but he popularized that phrase. It, it came sometime in the late 1800s. Some sculptor in France created that term. But <clears throat> the point is he popularized the concept that a building should look like its function. And this is an office building, an insurance company building. And now it's functioning as some other kind of office building. It's not the same company anymore. I don't even know if they exist, but it's a, a functioning building, 130 years old, works just as well as the day it opened. Okay, so it's stable. I don't see much dynamic at all, except these porthole windows, that's it. Everything else is totally right angles. Uh, and it is totally balanced, completely symmetrical, divided any way you want, uh, you know, across the wide facade up or down, left to right, or on the narrower side section, it, it's totally symmetrical. Uh, and it's meant to be, of course. And for space, it's 140 feet tall, because back then uh, each story was around 14 feet of space between the floor and the ceiling. Now they're more like 10. So this is about 140 feet tall with 10 stories. That's all you have to write about the space. Of course, different size rooms inside, but you don't have to be concerned with that. And then we have the modeling is the shadows from the sun in this case, just from the side here. And the lines here are actually, some of them are carved. There, I, I, sorry, I did overlook that. There are some decorative details between the windows, typically Sullivan, right? They're not as easy to see in the distance view, but uh, you can see them here. That's got carved line, because those are bas relief. And then this is metal, which is cast, but you could just say it looks like carved line. Otherwise, the lines are visual. The corners and the edges of the window framing, of course, create uh, visual lines. Uh, the largest mass, it's one single mass, right? Um, and let's see, the textures are the real smooth texture of glass and real rough textures of uh, brick. And uh, I guess you could say this looks rough. I mean, it's metal, but it's all, you know, decorated uh, detailing. So that would be a rough, real texture of metal, as well as the real rough brick and the uh, <clears throat> smooth, real glass. Okay. Moving on. If I had to pick one slide today that uh, people that aren't watching this lecture, if they don't watch the video of it, that'll be posted by Friday uh, or review for it. 
will might regret because there's a very high possibility of this being on the final. It's such an important uh, site. Uh, this is Frank Lloyd Wright, our second must know for tonight. You know, we're not, I said next week we'll do the two that are in Europe, right? Uh, the first two on, on tonight's syllabus. Okay, so this is uh, Wright. And of course, that's Frank Lloyd Wright. His last name is, you probably know, is W R I G H T. The Roby House, R O B I E, second word house, 1909. Why am I saying this is so important that it has probably the highest possibility if I had to give you the odds? I haven't made up the final yet, but it is very high on the list of likely because of three things. This house, which is in Chicago, I used to walk by it every day on the way to school when I was in grade school and early uh, middle school. So I got to know it pretty well. Uh, is often, this house, the Roby House, is often considered the first modern house, period. And Frank Lloyd Wright, nobody would argue with this, is the father of the modern house. Nobody would argue with that. Some people might, but they'd be on a losing up argument. I mean, you have to look at the, the early examples. This is well after his career was off and running. He was world famous. And I do mean world famous, not just in America, by the time he designed this house. So I'll say it again. Uh, this is often considered to be the first modern house designed by the father of the modern house, Frank Lloyd Wright. Well, that right there would make it important enough to be worthy of our attention. The other two reasons are it's on the UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's one of only two single family homes that are on that list. You know, that's all almost all for uh, big public buildings like the Taj Mahal, Notre Dame Cathedral, the Eiffel Tower, the White House, in case, of course, we know that isn't a single family residence. This is a single family residence. I'll say it again, that, that, that this is un almost unique. There's only one other single family residence on the UNESCO World Heritage List. And guess who designed the second one, Frank Lloyd Wright? We're gonna see it right after this one. So obviously if the world's major body that judges what buildings are so important or sites are so important, the whole world should preserve them, chose this, it, it must be for a good reason. And then the third reason is, that it introduces almost all of the concepts still being used today for modern houses. Now, I hate the phrase open concept. I hear it all the time on that the HGTV series. My wife loves watching those. So I occasionally sit down and watch them, where the couples are looking for houses in the US or Europe or Asia, and they only want open floor plans. Well, guess who invented that? This guy. Okay, so he was already well established when he designed this house, but it is the first one to have all of the major features that we consider part of a modern. Now, some people use the phrase mid-century modern, but look how early this is. It's not mid-century, it's way before it's early 20th century. In fact, he designed it in 1906, so that's when you really should have the date. But it wasn't finished due to uh, whether it was a recession and other reasons that it took longer to finish it. Uh, so that's why it's dated, the construction completion date is 1909, but the design is 06. Whoops, whoa, sorry, let's get back to that one. All right, so what is it about this house that makes it the first modern house, or you could say a prototype of all modern houses? That's a good way to put it, I'll repeat that phrase. This house is a prototype for all modern houses. Oh, single family, of course, residences, not compounds like, uh, Bill Gates and his now ex-wife built in Seattle. That's not a resident or single family structure. Uh, this is, <clears throat> the man who had it built doesn't matter. You have to write this as a banker, by the way. And he was a young up and coming kind of avant-garde, you know, experimental type guy. He wanted the most famous architect in America to design his home as a honeymoon present to his wife. And they probably got divorced about it two years after they moved in. Don't have to write that, but this now you do need to write. Okay, so what makes this a prototype of the modern house? Let's start with the fact that it has a free flowing floor plan. Now, if we go a little closer, we can get some hint of it. Uh, if I had more time, I'd show you my own slides. I was back there in 2015 with my daughter and we got a private tour by the docent who runs it. it it's open to the public now. It's not re a residence anymore. It's owned by the University of Chicago, by the way, and their architecture department maintains it. And it's literally hundreds of thousands, this is part of the meaning you could add, hundreds of thousands of 
people, mostly architecture students from all over the world come here every year and they have to make reservations. It's that popular, it gets booked up for weeks ahead. Uh, and that's because it is the prototype of the first modern house and Wright is known all over the world to architecture students, not just historians like me. Uh, and, and interior designers and urban planners, you know, in any design profession, uh, pretty much people know this house. Okay, so we have the open or free flowing floor plan. If you say open, it implies the whole thing is one big open box. It's not quite like that, but it's, it's much like what you think of when you walk inside, say, a mid-century modern house, or you see, you know, some of the more recently designed uh, tract houses uh, in suburban areas or all over the country. Uh, he opened up the floor plan. Victorians opposite, totally opposite. They were closed in, boxed in, divided up rooms, and uh, somewhere in between to me makes sense, but you know, when you get to too many closed in walls, you get dark, dank interiors. He hated that, right? Hated it, and so did his clients. So he opens up the floor plan, I'll repeat that phrase. This is the prototype for the open or free, a better phrase is free flowing floor plan. It literally has that. If you walk through it, you can see where uh, you're at one end. Let's say you're at this end, which is the end of the living room. The, the uh, windows take you all the way, the you know, inside of the, not the windows. I meant, <laughs> I meant the openings, the passageways. You can see all the way to the opposite end of the house from either end. That just wasn't even possible before. Right, came up with that. Okay, and then we have the fact that it's got minimal ornamentation. And so that's part of what the style is. So I need to give you that uh, short definition. It's, it's not too long. This is called prairie style. That's a phrase he created. He invented this style and he coined the phrase prairie, you know, because if you may not have heard Chicago's flat, there ain't no hills anywhere. There's no skiing anywhere in uh, Chicago, greater Chicago. You have to go way up north to get to hills. So it's all flat around there. And of course, that's called the prairie. So the word again with capital P, capital S for this style is prairie school. He invented that. He created it. And it is another word of a way, I mean, sorry, another way of saying uh, early modern houses. So what did those have? Those three features that are each one pretty brief. Prairie school houses had three features. Okay. One is sweeping horizontal lines. Well, you see that, look at this roof line. It's extended out over the deck here. And then again, it goes out on this end on the other side. And the same thing of the third story roof line. So the roof lines project outward way beyond where any roof lines ever did before. And that helps protect you, of course, during rainy, cold weather, you know, or hot summy, summer weather, I'm sorry, hot, um, humid weather. Uh, this gives you a little protection from the elements. But it also creates this, I'll say it again, first feature of all prairie school houses is the horizontal sweeping, I'm sorry, sweeping horizontal lines. Okay, and then minimal ornamentation. That may seem like, well, what's a big deal? Again, if you've ever looked at a Victorian era house, you know they were loaded with ornament. Again, Wright hated that and he wanted to have people get away from that. So when he designed houses, the only ornament here, there's two. The flower boxes, I think they're at either end, yeah, there they are, and there's stained glass on these windows here, but they're not solid stained glass, so the house would be very dark. They're just little hints of stained glass. By the way, the De Young Museum has a stained glass window designed by Frank Lloyd Wright that's in the section on uh, 19th century painting, which is kind of a weird place to put it. My, my uh, daughter and I saw that, and they bought it for a lousy $4,000. It's worth about $150,000. Now, one stained glass window from a Frank Lloyd house that was demolished somewhere else in the Midwest. These are original, all of these windows, and they, that, that is the only other one. So again, the second feature, I'll repeat that, for prairie school houses is uh, minimal ornament, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, very clean lines, you could say in parentheses. In other words, you see the sweeping clean lines. And then I already mentioned the third thing, so I'll repeat that, which is the uh, open, some people prefer that phrase. I think it's better to say free flowing floor plan. That'd be the third feature. And then the last two things I'll say about the meaning here are how the, how did they do, how did Wright do this, this roof line extending this far out over each end? Uh, how could he do that without any support? Look carefully, there are no columns, there's no wires, there's no brackets. There are no support structures anywhere on this roof line. 
Well, it's called cantilevered with pre-stressed concrete slabs. There's no other way to, we don't have time to go into the technology of it and I'm not an engineer, so I'll keep it simple. The roof lines are actually made out of slabs of reinforced concrete. Pre, sorry, pre-stressed, not reinforced. Reinforced concrete would collapse. It, it wouldn't be strong enough. So these have uh, the cables, metal cables inside them, which are so taut, pulled so tightly that they're like, you know, uh, kind of, harnesses that hold up the, the roof and they're embedded in concrete. So you have to write that, just keep it to a phrase, simple phrase. Pre-stressed concrete slabs allow for these cantilevered, or you could just say projecting roof lines. It, he invented that concept. That had never been used for a house. Now it had been used on bridges. So you might say, oh, well, he's borrowing from uh, engineers for bridges. Yes, but no one ever thought to do it on a house. Now you see that kind of thing on a lot of modern homes. And then the last fact about the uh, meaning is this, and I lived in the Midwest through about 13 winters. I was like 13 when you moved to California. If you don't have this, you're in trouble in the winter. It's called the uh, central utility shaft. That literally is what it is, where all the utilities are housed, all of them, right? I don't mean the, the stove and the refrigerator, those are in the kitchen. I mean the systems, I should say, such as the wiring, the plumbing, the heating, the air conditioning, you have to have all those in Chicago because it gets really hot and humid in the summer and it gets really cold in the winter. So if any one of those breaks down, this is the last factor I read about the meaning and we'll do a form analysis. If any of the systems break down, the heating, the wiring, the plumbing, the air conditioning, you don't have to go outside the house or underneath it to repair or fix or replace anything that's broken. You can go inside because those are the chimney shafts, but they also are open conduits inside this big, it's called the central utility core, just like the phrase sounds. And that's a brilliant, now that's totally an original idea. No one thought of before. Now, when you see track houses being built all over the, the world, really, but certainly all over the United States, usually you see after the foundation, the first thing that goes up is the central utility core where all of the conduits for all the systems, all, all of the services are housed. And so it makes it so much easier to maintain and repair. Okay, I think you get the idea. This is a pretty advanced piece of architecture. In fact, it it shocked people when it when it was first designed. It wasn't even uh, begun yet, and the plans were published in a dozen of major American magazines. You know, photos or illustrations, drawings by Wright's studio of this future house, and people thought it looked like some kind of spaceship, alien spaceship. They had those concepts back then. <laughs> I don't know if they thought that it was a UFO, literally, but people compared it to, you know, some kind of a, you know, otherworldly or outer space uh, object having landed in the middle of the south side of Chicago. Well, it started a trend, obviously, and it's still with us. Okay, formal analysis, pretty straightforward. This is completely symmetrical, totally symmetrical left to right. And of course, pretty obviously unbalanced or un, uh, weighted, I meant to the bottom toward the bottom. The rhythm is obvious with the cantilevered roof lines, the windows, the flower boxes, the trim, that's concrete trim, of course. And then we have lines. Well, the lines here are visual. You can't really see the carved lines. There really aren't any carved lines, but there aren't any. Uh, there would be some on the stained glass windows, some visual lines, but you can't see them in this photo. So just say the lines here are all visual lines around the edges of the uh, balconies and the uh, terraces. And uh, of course, the framing of the windows. The textures are all real. There's no simulated textures here. Real rough brick, real rough concrete, real rough tiles on the roof, and real smooth glass. So three rough textures, tiles, brick, concrete, and one real smooth textured glass. Well, you could mention wood too, if you want to. <laughs> that would be the framing of the windows. Uh, it is completely stable. There's nothing horizontal, but people don't think about it that way. When they stand here looking at it, I've heard people literally, I've been in the South many times since I left Chicago and just listen to people's comments as they get ready to go in or after they come out from you know going inside and, and, and taking photos. You can take as many photos as you want, by the way, if you ever go there. Anyway, the point is that people think of it as dynamic. It looks and feels dynamic when you're, especially when you cross the street at a diagonal or angle, looking at it like this. But look at every single line in it, every single section. It is completely stable. And then we have for space, it's a three-story house. It's about 4,500 square feet. It's a good size house because there are living quarters on this floor too. This isn't the basement. 
there is no basement actually i don't think at least there wasn't the last time i went there so so it's three living uh, stories of living space totaling about i don't remember how many how, uh, rooms probably a dozen rooms uh, totaling about 4500 square feet uh, which is a good size house right okay and then we have the colors warm on the brick and the wood framing of the windows cool on the roof tiles and the concrete and then the modeling is the shadows from the sun which are very deep here because of the overhanging the, the roof lines here and there is oh uh, yeah there are there are three masses if you want to break it down for the last element here on this slide the first level would be the largest mass because it's obviously the widest then the second level which is the main living space where the living room and the kitchen and the dining room are and then the upstairs where most of the bedrooms are is the third largest mass okay um i'm thinking i might go ahead and come back to these and let's see where is falling water let's see did i put yeah we're going to do falling water now because i know i skipped over some we're going back to those um, and this is right because the two kind of, you know, uh, are, are interesting comparisons to each other. This is the, uh, it is on the syllabus too, the next listed slide, right? Falling water, 1936. Okay, falling water, just like it sounds, two words, and I already spelled right, it's last name, and the date, 1936, again, is a day it was complete, a date it was completed, it actually goes back further. I think I have it. Yeah, there's a better view. Yeah, let's look. Yeah, let's look this much better photo. Yeah, because the one I got from the slide library wasn't that good. All right. So if you haven't heard of this, I, I'm surprised. It's a pretty famous building because it's the first house. Now it's one of hundreds, if not thousands all over the US and probably many more around the world built over a live waterfall, a, an active, you know, uh, you know, running waterfall. Um, no one had thought to do anything like that before Wright did. So it's called Falling Water because of the setting, of course. But this is now a later style that he helped develop after he had done 40 or 50 years as a prairie school. I guess he got tired, burned out, or he felt it was time to come up with something new. So he came up with this. He calls it U, so, one word, capital U-S-O-N-I-A-N. Usonian, it's a made up word. He, he wanted people to think of these as the more affordable version. I mean, after all that Prairie House was 4,500 square feet, right? We saw it was three stories and it's in a very expensive location and what was at the time already, a, a, you know, a decent neighborhood. I mean, it's not a wealthy neighborhood. It's Obama's old neighborhood, my old neighborhood on the South side of Chicago, but it wasn't a poor neighborhood or, or, or out in the country. This is an affordable house for most people. Although most people don't own the land, <laughs> what the, the, this guy did. He was uh, the man was who had it designed by Wright was a, a department store magnet. Sounds like somebody who attracted right? his body was made out of metal. He just owned a bunch of department stores. So of course he was wealthy. But the house is a prototype for what Wright decided would be the next wave that he hoped would become the next wave of uh, middle class housing all over the United States. He used the term. I'll repeat the phrase again. It's one word. Uh, the word Usonian, U-S-O-N-I-A, is the style that he used for this house. It's one of the first ones in that style. In other words, the parts are interchangeable. That's another way of, of, of defining what he meant by Usonian. And the materials are supposedly more affordable. Well, that's not always the case because this is field stone, which comes from right there, from the rocks around it. But it's expensive to mine it carve it up and then you know fit it into place because if you look closely you see that's pretty fancy uh craftsmanship there so most people would have just made a brick there's your central utility core again so he's still using that but the rest of the house has a lot of different aspects it still has two of the three things the prairie style had the usonian houses kept two of the prairie features one is the free flowing floor plan all three floors of the three-story house as you can probably see have this open or free flowing floor plan the, this house has all of all the floors have that well the bedrooms of course are, are, are enclosed as are the bathrooms other other rooms are all open or free flowing floor plans okay and then the other thing was uh the minimal ornament he didn't believe in ornamental decorations and details but it has a lot more detailing that is modern at that time 1930s of course 
seems ancient to almost all of us today, but they were new mo modular, modular, right? Things that can be mass produced and, and interchangeable and shipped in parts, literally, you know, in boxes and you assemble like the windows. If you look closely, I think you can see that. Now, maybe the next slide might have one advantage. Let's see. Well, stop, stop, stop. Here we go. Yeah, I think you can see the windows better here, but it's not that well focused. So we're going to go back to the other one. Yeah, because it's just a better photo overall. And the, the lighting is better as well as the colors are more accurate. Um, anyway, so what you have is natural materials taken from the site. The concrete was made from sand right there. You know, like here, you see some of the sand used in that very concrete right there. So it is a natural house. He called it organic is the other word for it. Usonian is the style. Organic is the construction techniques. That means natural materials from the local environment are nearby, not necessarily right inside of the house, but the materials weren't got, taken from across the country or from a different region. They're, these are in the mountains. I mean, this house, I'm sorry, this house, all the materials in it uh, and the house uh, are in the uh, mountains of Pennsylvania. Yes, there are mountains, or they call them mountains. They're 4,000 feet. That's not much of a mountain in California, but that's considered mountains back east. So, so this is in the Pennsylvania mountains. And it's a, a vacation house for this wealthy uh, department store chain owner. But he asked Wright to do something to allow him to enjoy the view of the waterfall. That's how Wright came up with the idea. He assumed Wright would build the house over here, right? Looking at the waterfall across the river. Here, there were creek, it's just a little creek. But instead, Wright came up with this brilliant idea of building the house right over the waterfall and then all you have to do is walk up to the balcony and look over and you can see it down straight below you uh, every day of the year that you care well in the winter, of course, it's frozen. It probably is solid ice in the dead of winter, but most of the year it flows right under the house. So it was just a brilliant idea no one had ever conceived of for a house and it immediately caught the attention of the world. And yes, it's part of the meaning. It's the only other single family residence besides the Roby House on UNESCO World Heritage List is this house. And they're both by right. So that pretty much tells you how influential he was, of course. He called himself the world's greatest architect, by the way. Oh, good. All right, welcome. We were just doing the second Frank Lloyd Wright house. This is, we just you know talked about the meaning. So it's on your syllabus as uh, right, of course, the last name is in Frank Lloyd Wright, Falling Water, 1936. So he was uh, he was uh, so egotistical that whenever he testified in court, oh, he was sued by all kinds of people, ex-wives, lovers, <laughs> uh, the uh, moral, some morality group called him immoral because he lived in sin, you know, unmarried with the wife of one of his clients. The man's personal life just is soap opera doesn't do it justice. I mean, any soap opera, Mexican American, uh, it, it, his life was a nonstop dramatic episode. But he was somehow still able to focus on his work all through the entire upheaval of his personal life. So every time he was in court, he would say, I have to write this. He'd be asked to take the oath, you know, under oath to testify. And he would always, they would say, name Frank Lloyd Wright, profession, world's greatest architect. He always answered that that way. That's how he thought of himself. And the other phrase he used is the right hand of God. <laughs> so yeah, he had an ego as big as the outdoors, but he also had the talent to go with it. Okay, so wrapping up now, we'll do the formal analysis. Um, <clears throat> so this is balanced. If you were to stand right here and look straight at it, you know, it, it would have the same number of, you know, of, I mean, uh, same amount of space on either side of this central <laughs> utility core here, right? Uh, and so it's, it's, it's balanced left to right. And of course, unbalanced, obviously wider at the bottom. Then the colors are warm on the metal. It's, it's a red painted metal on the windows, uh, the framing of the windows, obviously not the windows themselves. And uh, warm on the concrete, it's a light yellow. He liked warm colors on his uh, materials on the outer walls, which is a one of the nicer things about his work, I think. Uh, but this is definitely cool. All of the stonework is cool. Of course, so it's a mixture of the two. The largest mass would be the, the, the uh, ground floor, of which you see cantilevers out. Remember that phrase from the last slide of the Roby House. Cantilevers or projects out on either side. 
here, much more so than the roof above it, but that does as, as well to protect people when they're standing outside the windows, looking down at the waterfall, right? From rain, at least, if not snow, maybe. <laughs> the elements right and then we have the um <clears throat> stable it, it is another one of these where it's technically every single part of this is stable there are no curved or diagonal lines but it feels dynamic because of the way he orients the parts uh so you'd have to say technically completely stable though it gives it a dynamic appearance the textures of real textures of smooth concrete smooth glass and metal and rough field stone you could just say stone but it's taken from the field right there i mean so, well, probably further away than this view of it. Uh, and then we have uh, for space, it's a three story uh, single family home divide, uh, with open floor plans for the main rooms. Of course, we're talking about just the common rooms, right? Uh, and uh, as I recall, the square footage is, a, is, is something close to four, 4,800, say, say four to 5,000. So it's in that range, it might be over 4,500 feet. And that's real space. Of course, there is the modeling of the shadows from the sunlight. And then we have the, um, um, let's see, mass. Am I forgetting anything here? I'm trying to think of a stable versus dynamic. I think we covered everything, yeah. Okay, uh, let's go back to when we skipped it. And we'll take an early break. And we will end early tonight. I'm sure everyone would appreciate that. I would, certainly. But let's do one of these two. Um, uh, remaining, I'm sorry, one more, remaining one before the break. Okay, this one is Maybeck, M-A-Y-B-E-C-K. His last name was Maybeck, M-A-Y-B-E-C-K. First Church of Christ Scientist. If you want to write First Christian Scientist Church, that's how I, I've always heard it said, but the church itself that owns it still functioning as the church the way it was designed to. Uh, they call the, this building First Church of Christ Scientist. Some of you may know that Christian science, right, is a subcategory of Christian religions, right? Sort of new age, right? <clears throat> 1910 is the date it was uh, completed. So what do we see here? We see a building by the father of green design. And I cannot overstate his importance. And yet I'll bet you never heard of him unless you've been to and happen to know what this building was. We'll see that, I guess, after the break, right? I mean, that's more famous, but this is his, most people consider his greatest masterpiece, right? And Maybeck were rivals, but Maybeck believed in not promoting himself. That's why he's not remembered as well. So you could say he was modest in terms of his personality and his attitude. He never believed in self-promotion, and that's what Wright was excellent at, as you can tell from what I've already mentioned about how famous he became. However, Maybach, during his lifetime, became nationally famous. There were Life magazine articles on him. Uh, Wright came to visit him once, and he, he snubbed Wright. I think that's a funny story, because Wright was always speaking down about every other architect. Oh, none of them were up to his level. And then he somehow decides he wants to see uh, Maybach's houses in Berkeley. And Maybeck lived in Berkeley and Maybeck said, nah, I don't need to meet him. <laughs> so they had a rivalry going. But the main point is that Maybeck focused on meeting the needs of his clients is the first feature of First Bay tradition. And you see this list here, four main features. We'll do them now. This is the last new definition or set of terms that you need to write for this semester. Here we go. Four main features of First Bay tradition architecture. It's at the bottom of the same page we've been on here, lists, uh, a list of uh, terms to know. So what are they? We already mentioned the first one, I'll repeat it, uh, that uh, each building uniquely suited the needs of its clients. Actually, I didn't say it that way, so I'll say it and re repeat it, I mean, uh, slowly. Each building uniquely suited the needs of its clients. That means he worked with the client as part of the design concept or team work as an approach. He didn't tell the client what the client should want. Totally opposite of Frank Lloyd Wright. Wright would often browbeat, some would say bully. In fact, that's not too strong a word, bully. I've talked to people who were uh, alive when Wright was designing their home. They're in their 80s and 90s now, but he, he kept working until almost 1960. And they said the only thing they didn't like about it was how much of a bully he was. If he didn't like something they wanted, he forced them to change it. And this would be their own house, you know? So that's how uh, Wright's ego operated. Maybach, uh-uh, 
not that at all. He decided that if someone needed certain features, now, of course, if they had an impractical and infeasible concept that wouldn't be safe, you know, or, or, or affordable, then he would maybe try to dissuade them. But he worked with the client. So again, first feature I'll repeat that is uh, that each building uniquely suited the needs of its client. The second feature is that they all they used only natural materials honestly stated so all the materials were natural and honestly stated it means he didn't disguise things to be something else now that is true of right too i kind of already said he used organic materials we already covered that with the last slide and so did uh, so did maybeck but maybeck was doing it before right Maybeck was already designing houses in 1890, and he was the first architecture professor at UC Berkeley. And if you don't know this, maybe a few of you have a friend or two who are interested in architecture or know someone who actually is. A, the UC Berkeley Architecture School is considered one of the best in the world, and he started it. He founded it. And he founded it with the idea of these natural materials being the basis for you know, locally sourced. Uh, and so that's similar to Wright. That's true. But he added the feature that they shouldn't be disguised as anything other than the other. So I'll state again the second feature. Okay. All natural materials honestly stated is the second feature of all first Bay tradition buildings. And of course, it's called Bay tradition because it was invented in the Bay Area by this man and other followers of his. We'll talk about his main follower is a woman, Julia Morgan, we'll get to after the break. Okay. And then uh, the third feature is the buildings integrate with their site. I walked by this building for years. I was sitting in all his, uh, the, again, all the first Bay tradition buildings, not the Palace of Fine Art in San Francisco. It's not supposed to integrate with the site. It was a World's Fair building. Of course, those buildings are supposed to stand out. But whenever he did this style, which he called first, or he, he didn't name it, someone else later, first Bay tradition, then the third feature was the buildings integrate with their site. I think you can see that this building practically looks like it. And he designed it this way from the get go. It's not like when he first uh, had finished it, it, it didn't have these features. And then suddenly it slowly kind of blended with it. It was always meant to be that way. He designed these trellises, for example, to you know be overgrown and the big trees. These trees were there before the house uh, or see and I said house. It looked like a, a large house. Some people don't even know it's a church. Most people can't guess it's a church. When you look at it, that's the first thing you think of. You might think of it as some kind of a compound or a school maybe, but uh, it is a functioning church with multiple uh, use rooms inside. Anyway, those the, he, he said, keep the old redwood trees. They were already pretty big then. Now, of course, they're much taller and, and make them part of the site. So again, the third feature of this is um, that uh, each building integrates with its site. And then the last feature is pretty straightforward, and that is uh, a uh, blend of uh, of historic motifs, you know, decorative detail. See, that's different than right, right. A blend of historic motifs with modern building materials. For instance, you see where the arrow is? That window is made out of reinforced concrete. Not the glass, obviously, but the framing around it. And that's a modern material, very modern. Right, concrete with rebar in it. So just say, you know, it's made out of concrete or reinforced concrete to be more exact. And yet it looks just like a Gothic window on a Gothic cathedral because he loved traditional detailing. So he did not get rid of all the decorative details the way Wright did. He incorporated them into design. These columns, for instance, have a somewhat Renaissance feel to them. They even have uh, figures of, of uh, Renaissance dressed, men and women dressed in Renaissance style clothing. It's kind of neat, yeah, but of course it's very different than Wright. Wright would never do that. Well, he did in his early years. Yeah, when he was working for Sullivan, he did because Sullivan taught him that. But as soon as he left Sullivan, he stopped using ornamental detail. But not Maybeck. Maybeck always thought, like Sullivan had, that a building should have something to quote delight, delight. I'm sorry, the eye of the beholder. Okay, that's pretty much the whole meaning. I just say it's a functioning church. It still is exactly what it was designed for, the Christian Science Church in Berkeley owns it and it's open every Sunday. If you want extra credit and you want a free guided tour, I recommend you go here uh, and show up at noon any Sunday, even if it's Christmas day, well, that'd be after the semester, way afterwards. Don't wait till after the semester if you want extra credit, but any day, uh, any Sunday, I'm sorry, any Sunday of the year, uh, they give guided tours here. And this is on the National Register, the last fact now about the meeting. It's on the National Register of Historic Sites, which is not 
you know, the same as the UNESCO World Heritage, it's applied to be on that list and it may get on that list, but right now it's, it's on the US, the same similar idea of the US government. And it is a government body, right? National Register of Historic Sites. It's, it's on there as it well deserves to be. And it's also a state historic landmark. So it gets funding from both state and federal occasionally. It's had to be repaired a few times, but never serious. It's a, no severe damage ever. It survived fires and earthquakes and uh, you know, riots, student riots. This is right near the UC Berkeley campus. It's like three blocks away. Tear gas, yeah, it's, it's been through a lot in 112 years because uh, it was designed in 1909 and finished the next year. Okay, so here we go, formal analysis, and then I guess we'll take an extra early break. You know what, we should do the Palace of Fine Arts though. We should, because it's not, as they won't take us long to talk about it. It is two, arch two slides about the same architect. And then we'll take a shorter break than usual, if people agree, and still end, oh, I'd say half an hour early, easy. All right, so we'll do the formal analysis. It's, it's completely symmetrical, uh, left to right, and unbounced toward the bottom, as is true of almost every slide tonight, of course. Uh, and then we have the, uh, except the first one we saw, right, of the Wainwright building. Then we have the materials. Wow, this, is, this list could be very long. So let's just keep it to the main ones. It's all natural, real materials. So we have real rough wood. It should be obvious that's a wood, right, beaming. It's a porch, overhanging porch, which of course has wood framing. So that's real rough wood real rough concrete on the columns and the tracery. You can just see the trim over the windows. And then this is real smooth metal and glass. These windows, that's a very modern technique. It's almost like a factory style window, but it lets more light in. These are beautifully tinted glass. If you ever go inside the suit, I mean, they're yellow, kind of a warm colored tinted glass. So the real glass and real metal uh, are smooth textures. And then the real rough concrete, right? Uh, and the real rough wood, that's that's enough. And those are the main materials you can see. And of course, it's got the rhythm of these windows with all the different small panes and the columns and the brackets or beams, you can use either word, on the uh, overhanging roof line or porch. Uh, it is dynamic and stable, but I guess equal parts because the walls and the windows, of course, the columns are stable, but there's a lot of dynamic detail, which both Wright and Maybeck love dynamic features. And you see that here on the overhanging <clears throat> or cantilevered, right? Um, roof line here. And then on the Gothic tracery on the windows, if you were to go walk around it, you'd see a lot more of the Gothic detailing on it, on some of the other large windows. For space, it's got one large auditorium which can hold 600 people. It's a nice big auditorium. It's on the cover of the book I wrote about Maybeck and it's it's been in several um, movies and documentaries. The inside of this church is it's breathtaking, but the ceiling is only 40 feet high and people never guess that. They guess 60, 70 feet every time on every tour. I've been on dozens of tours here because I used to do that for extra credit. I'd, I'd give students um, 20 points if they came to Berkeley and went on one of my walking tours. And I always, if we did this area of Berkeley, we'd start with this church, begin the tour by going inside. Like I said, it, you can go on your own though, any Sunday at noon, every Sunday of the year. But the point is that this inside the space is remarkably, um, what's the word? I don't wanna say disguised, that sounds like somehow it's closed off. Uh, you know, surprising. People never guess that the ceiling is more than, uh, is, is less than 30 feet tall, uh, sorry, 40. <laughs> it's about 36 or 37 feet tall, under 40 feet. So just say it this way, keep it simple. The ceiling of the main room, which can hold 600 people, the auditorium, they call it, is under 40 feet tall. You don't have to say it appears to be 60 feet, but it, most people guess that. And then the other smaller rooms are all around it. The, the, you know, reading rooms, libraries, meeting rooms, and so forth. <clears throat> okay, and then uh, let's see. Modeling is just the shadows and the sun. The line here is all visual. There's, there is carved line on the columns, but you, you can't see it in the slides. You can just say visual line around the windows, right? And at the corners. Okay, and the largest mass is uh, in this, it's the entryway. I'd call this one mass. Pretty much this whole area is in one section. And uh, then it's the, the, well, it's a close call <laughs> because you can see uh, a good section of both two wings off to the left and right. Okay. All right, let's, we'll finish up with this. It won't take that long, but I think most of you have been here. I assume you've at least seen it. 
starting with Alfred Hitchcock's movie Vertigo, every other film practically ever filmed in San Francisco, they go here, the rock with the, you know, it wasn't the other rock, not Dwayne Johnson. <clears throat> you know, uh, just there's all kinds of movies that have been filmed here over the years because it's so beautiful. So this is, we'll take, uh, let's do this one fairly quickly. It's Maybeck and it is um, the Nazi. Did I not include it? I thought I put it on this week's list. I may not have, in which case we'll take an even earlier break. Yeah, I'm giving you guys a break here. All right, so I'm just gonna tell you what it is and we'll take a break in like three minutes. Okay, this is the Palace of Fine Arts. It's a good option for extra credit. You can't get a bad photo of it, but all you have to do is take four shots from whatever angles you want. That's very easy. It's open to the public as a, uh, you just walk into it. And it was for the 1915 World's Fairs, uh, Fair, sorry. It was their Palace of Fine Arts. It was where all the painting and sculpture was displayed. Not in the rotunda, <laughs> that's for purely effect. The building behind it, which is still there, it used to be the Exploratorium. Now I don't know what it is. It's some other kind of art gallery or something. So the building was built for a World's Fair, but it was the only one saved of the entire hundred plus buildings at that 1915 San Francisco Fair. It's the only one people loved so much, they insisted on saving this site. The others were all torn down. That's why you probably most you've never heard of that fair. But it was a big fair, do 20 million people. And it was to celebrate rebuilding after the earthquake of 1906. So the city had fully recovered from then. But this is the building people love so much that they raised a million dollars. It may sound like nothing now. It's just, you're lucky if you can buy a bungalow for that. But a million dollars in 1915 was a lot of money. I think it was a little more actually. By the time they finished restoring it, because it was made out of plaster. It wasn't meant to be permanent. Now it is in a stronger set of material concrete, of course, over metal framing. And Maybeck designed it to look like an ancient Roman temple. And that's exactly what people think of when they see it. But it's his idea to put the lagoon there. This is the last thing I'll say. He did the landscaping too. And the landscaping is what I think makes it work so beautifully because the way everything reflects, especially at night, if you've never been there and you have a chance and you're just in the city for something else and you've got a little time before you drive home, go by here after dark. It's all lit up in different colors, like it was during the World's Fair over 106 years ago when it was the most popular building at that fair. So it's a pretty remarkable structure and it's been uh, the background for all things, all kinds of events. San Francisco, uh, let's see, two or three presidential debates were held, not in the rotunda again, of course, the building, which he designed back here. That's where the exhibits were, where, where the old exploratory was. And it's used for weddings when we go, we saw all these quinceaneras, I think I said it right, half a dozen of them. When my daughter and I were there on Sunday after we went to the Dion, we walked by here because she's a photography student and wants to keep her A grade in that class. So she took a bunch of really interesting angles that most people, I mean, there's so many ways to get good photos from this site that aren't just like this one, you know, book cover photos like this has been done a hundred thousand times probably, but you can do whatever you want. If you want extra credit, all you have to do for any architecture site, including this one, is four photos, uh, you know, different views, of course, in color, please, and send them to me as a um, PDF. And just take, tell me the site of the building, you know, the name of it. You don't have to even write the year, the other thing, just the name and the city or you know, the location in your name and the class, and you'll get 10 points. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Why don't we go ahead and take an 18 minute break? We'll now make it 17. So that would mean some. 8, uh, 8.05, okay, and we should be able to end, uh, oh, easily, maybe even before nine, but we do have a few more must know, so don't, don't take off. Uh, in fact, Julia Morgan, equally important to Frank Lloyd Wright, or uh, equally uh, likely to be a, a Julia Morgan slide as a Frank Lloyd Wright one. One or the other or both of them will have a slide on the final. So you do want to hear that, and then we'll still end oh, more than half an hour early today. All right. I'm going to pause the recording. I'll see you guys in about 16 minutes. Okay. All right. Um, before we get to the next must know, I just this is just for your own information. You, you don't even have to write it at all, but I haven't actually uh, clarified the term building as to what, what is a building? Um, is this a building? 
what we're looking at, the Palace of Fine Arts. Well, yes, most people would say, but in architecture terms, you know, in, in the professional architectures, uh, you know, definition, a building is a structure that can house people 24 hours a day for living or work purposes. So what isn't a building would be the Eiffel Tower. That's not a building. We'll talk about that when we get to the slide of the Eiffel Tower. I know we might even have time to do that tonight because uh, now let's do that next week. Yeah, we still want to end extra early tonight. <clears throat> but in any case, that's not a building. And neither is the CNN. No, it's not CNN. That's not it. CN, Canadian something tower in Toronto, tallest building in this hemisphere. It's over 2,000 feet. You can go up in it and look around, but nobody lives in it. And nobody works in it. Uh, 24 hours a day. So a building is meant to be inhabited is the point. So this wouldn't qualify as a building. It's a structure or site. Then, of course, it wasn't, you know, ever uh, inhabited at all. Uh, although some people might sleep here, you know, they had nowhere else to go, but it's not what it was designed for. And the interior of the building behind it there, that the exhibit hall, that was once the display case. Yes, Luis. Yeah, where, let's see, can I? Is this a must know? No, um, thank you for asking. You, you helped clarify. I only briefly said that it wasn't. I took, uh, it used to be, it's, it's on my original syllabus. And I realized this late in the semester, you guys have plenty of things you've already taken notes on and, you know, more adding still more tonight and next week. So I'm giving you a break. I took it off the syllabus, the Palace of Fine Arts. I just think it's something everyone should at one time or another while you live in the Bay Area, now it's safe to go into San Francisco, you know, they're in the yellow tier now, you know, right? And here there wasn't social distancing, but it didn't matter, it was outdoors, there was no danger. It's safe, totally safe to go there now and, and take some time and walk all the way around it. There's different angles and different perspectives from the different views of it that everywhere you look, there's something beautiful in, you know, the, the, the layout of it, the details of the features. These are 18 foot tall women here that are a morning uh, actually, those are the men, right? The women are on the other side. I forgot that. But they're mourning the loss of art. And this was built during World War I, if you know your history, well into World War I. We weren't in the war yet, but Europe was tearing itself apart. And Maybeck was aware of that. And he knew how many beautiful cathedrals and museums and uh, historic neighborhoods had been destroyed. You know, there was bombings in World War I. Most people don't realize that there were airplanes that dropped bombs on cities in World War I. You know, hand made handheld bombs but so what they still blow up when they hit the ground and kill blood nowhere near as many people as world war ii but there were bombing raids in world war one so he was saddened by that of course understandably and so he had these 18 foot tall female figures on the uh, in in the opposite side of this standing weeping with their shoulders you know their heads on their on their uh, arms resting on their arms and all you can see is the back and their shoulders and the back of their heads but they're called the weepers anyway it's a, there's no site like it anywhere else in the united states the closest thing might be um, the water tower at Philoli. you know where that is the famous house has been used in a lot of movies too on the peninsula san mateo county it's uh you know the big estate now it's open to the public is a museum and flower garden several acres uh, but that that has near the end of it or toward near it, it has a um, very similar building by a, an architect who studied in Berkeley at UC Berkeley with Maybach. But his most famous student we're going to get to right now is one of the two top um, important people for tonight's lecture. And like I said, when we get, let's go now to the next must know here. Uh, to this next slide and, and her work. There'll be two slides of hers that are on the syllabus. You want to take extra thorough notes and study them extra carefully because there's a high possibility of her, one of her two slides from this tonight's lecture being on the final Y. Okay, let's give you the title first. This is uh, Morgan, as in Julia was her first name, M-O-R-G-A-N, Morgan. Casa Grande at Hearst Castle. Casa Grande, and you know, that would be Spanish for big house, right? At Hearst Castle, and Hearst is uh, spelled H-E-A-R-S-T, 1925. Okay, I'm gonna start with a question before you even take your notes. Has anybody in our small but dedicated group that's with us tonight been to Hearst Castle, anybody? 
nobody hmm surprised usually at least one out of well <laughs> one out of ten would still be uh <laughs> less than the total number we have tonight uh, it's uh, well worth the trip it's down on the uh central california coast and you can't really do it in a day and come back it's literally halfway almost exactly between la and san francisco it's worth if you're on your way to Southern California or back up from Southern California, just take an extra day and go here. It's, it's, to see this site is something no other place on the West Coast compares to. It's the largest, here, here we go. This is the main residence. That's why it's called Casa Grande. For Hearst Castle, which was the compound, residential compound, it's the right phrase, residential compound of William Randolph Hearst. And that's only one beginning point of meaning of why it's such an important and such a beautiful site. William Randolph Hearst, I hope you've all heard of him. His name's all over on buildings, streets, you know, um, residential, well, no, not, I'm an academic. All kinds of college buildings are named after him, yeah. He was the first media mogul. I mean, there's no other way to put it. He was the first media, um, you know, what's the word? Well, mogul is the best word, but you know, uh, someone with multimedia uh, control. He controlled newspapers, not every newspaper in America, but the largest newspaper chain, it's still around. <laughs> the Chronicle, the San Jose paper, I don't know what the other one said. Yeah, anyway, hundreds of newspapers back when he ran this. He, he was first and most famous at first for uh, founding the largest newspaper chain in America. But he grew out from there to where he controlled uh, radio stations, movie, th uh, movie uh, studios, and theaters. So both ends of the film industry, right? And the careers of actors. He, he became the third wealthiest man in America. This is all part of the meaning now. So who he was matters a lot because this wouldn't be here if it weren't for who he was and how wealthy and powerful he was. Now, that is only what I think a secondary but important fact or part of the meaning of this. The other is who the architect was, and that's what I hope you will remember even long after this course is faded in your memory. Someday you maybe go here, or if not, go to see her four houses uh, for extra credit. Of course, take what photo of each for uh, you know Julie Morgan's houses in Petaluma, or, or any of her other books that are in, uh, sorry I meant buildings that are in my book on Julie Morgan. Now if I had thought of it, I've held up that book for you to look at because it's pretty obvious. There are a bunch of books on her now, but mine was only the second book published on Julie Morgan. The first one was by a woman who's since passed away, and it's a good book too. But uh, now there's like 15, 20 books about her. Why? Here's the main facts you should know about. Julia Morgan was the first licensed female architect to have her own independent practice in the United States. That's not a small accomplishment, I'll say it again. She was the first licensed female architect to have her own practice, you don't even have to say independent, in the United States, 1904. She opened her office in San Francisco, but she was already an architect before that. She had gone to the Paris School of Architecture. You should have the right name. If it's on the exam, I'll accept that phrase because that's sort of what people you know, think of it. But it was called Ecole. It's French. You don't have to worry about the spelling. It's French for school, E-C-O-L-E, -E, of Beaux Art, meaning the School of Beautiful Art. Beau is beautiful in French, B-E-A-U-X, art, just like it is in English. The Ecole de Beaux Art uh, was the top architecture school on earth. Nobody argues with that. Yes, Louise. Yeah, hang on. What? I hope I, I try to, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, Louise. Can you oh, I can't say it one more time. Yes. The the school. Yes, absolutely. Sorry, I'll say it slowly and spell it. Yes, Ecole. That's E C O L E, if you want to write it correctly. I won't hold you the spelling of beautiful art in French. It's beau. Ecole, right, of, and then uh, third word, well, after of is beau, French for beautiful, B-E-A-U-X, right? And then the last word, just like in English, art. So again, Ecole de Beaux Arts was the greatest school of architecture in the world. No woman had ever been allowed to even sit in, not even visit any of their classes 
on architecture. Now, some women were taking the painting and sculpture classes. That was allowed. But oh, woman architect? Whoa, no one wants a woman designing a building, right? <laughs> well, you may know the story, some of you. Typical sexist attitudes. So Julia Morgan was a student. This is part of the story behind her. And if you want me to, I will tell you the, the, the overview and then summarize it so you can write the shorter version. If you prefer, just listen. Uh, I'll do both. Okay, so you can either write this and then you'll know more about her than you necessarily need to remember for the exam. But someday it may be of interest to you if you ever go see any of her buildings. But for the test, I'll summarize what you do. You definitely need to know after I tell you this. Okay, so do it that way. Because there's so much to say about her, I have to just hit the highlights. Okay, besides being the first woman to go to the Ecole Beaux Arts, she, before that, in her 20s, she's the first woman to graduate with a degree in engineering from any California university. UC Berkeley had a school of engineering in the 1890s. Now, look how far back that is 130 years ago. Other women had gone into that program and dropped out. Either they weren't given credit, they weren't treated right, they, they, they burned out, whatever the reason, doesn't matter. A few other women had, had, had been admitted to the engineering school at UC Berkeley. She's the only one at first, sorry, the first one to get a degree. So she was an engineer when women weren't even supposed to study outside the home except for, you know, teaching maybe and, and nursing, right? So she broke the glass ceiling in a bunch of ways. That's the first way. The second is when she studied architecture while she was in engineering, they also had a young architect named Bernard Maybeck. We just talked about him, right? The, the last architect before the break. And he was uh, head of the, what was then the very beginnings of the architecture program at Berkeley. And he saw how talented it was, she was, and he said to her, why don't you become the first woman to get a degree from a Cole Bowes Art? He had gone there as every other successful architect in America, except Frank Lloyd Wright. Wright was after all the right hand of God. He didn't need to be trained, Wright was totally self-taught. That, that is a remarkable thing. I forgot to mention about him, but you have to add that at this point. You could just say that the, every other successful architect uh, and they were all men before Julia Morgan had gone to Cole Beaux Arts. So she thought, well, yeah, I'd like to, but they're not letting women in. He said, I, don't let that stop you. Why don't you become the first? So he wrote her a letter of recommendation. She went, she took the test. She passed it in the top 10%, like seven or 8%. They're supposed to let the top 10% in. That was the rule. Of, they didn't. No one told her why. She just was rejected. No explanation. She got suspicious, but she thought, oh, well, it's too late to, you know, they didn't give the test a second time. It, you have to wait a year. So she spent a year in Paris studying architecture and, and getting small designing jobs. So then she went back and took the test a second time and she just taught, uh, placed in the top 5%. And this time when they rejected her, again, no explanation, she got a little angry and she asked the architecture school dean, why have you rejected my application? And here's what he said to her. You don't have to write any of this. It's because we don't want to encourage young ladies in our profession. Well, it's the wrong thing to say to Julia Morgan because that just made her more determined. So she went back another year to just, you know, bide her time, but keep learning on her own about architecture and, and getting small little jobs, right? Because she didn't have a degree yet. And then she took the test the third time. She passed in the top 3%. And by this time, the French press got on the story and they said, let her in for heaven's sakes. It's embarrassing that you're not letting this woman and she's more qualified than almost all your male applicants. So she, they let her as the first woman, they let her into the School of Architecture in Paris uh, in uh, 1900. No women had been ever allowed. And she graduated in two years. It's a four degree program, four year, sorry, four year degree program. She finished it in two years. That's how talented she was. Came back in 1902, started working for UC Berkeley's architecture department. Maybeck was still there at the time, but he didn't run it anymore. Someone else had gotten that job and it, you know, become a big deal, right? So this is this guy from New York. This is the last, the anecdote I'll say that we'll get to the details of the building and all that. Um, he was uh, the architect of the Campanile. Some of you know the UC Berkeley campus. All the major buildings between 19 hundred and about 1930 were his designs. He was a good architect, but he's also a pompous ass, excuse me, and a sexist, which isn't unusual back then. But Maybeck wasn't, but he was. His name is John Galen Howard. So he hired Julie Morgan because Maybeck recommended her, and she was the best person on his staff of dozens of architects 
that would implement, now he designed the buildings, but he needed the help of these people to complete them. So one day he was at a faculty uh, event somewhere in someone's house, probably his own, and he was uh, talking about uh, the people that worked for him and without giving away the name or the sex of this person, he said, oh, one of these people who works for me, I want to praise more highly than the others because this person is more talented. I can depend on this person to do everything right and to supervise the crews and come up with solutions to problems. And the best thing is I only pay that person half what I pay the others as it is a woman. Literally, he called her an it. <laughs> Guess what? She heard about that. Probably made back to her. I assume he was at that event. She cleaned out her desk. And a week later, she opened her own office in San Francisco. So I'll repeat that and summarize, I mean, you know, summarize that. She was the first woman accepted. How many glass ceilings did she need to break? The first woman <laughs> to get a degree in engineering from any California university. The first woman admitted to the School of uh, Architecture in Paris. You can just say it that way, but the right word is a cold, both are. The first woman to um, set up her own office, independent, sorry, I meant licensed, sorry, licensed architect, woman, architect. I said that at the beginning, but if you didn't write it, you should now. That's probably the most amazing achievement. Again, the first licensed woman architect to open her own office. All the others before, oh, they've been for about 20 years, women architects, but they all had to partner with a male partner because they wouldn't get commissions if they didn't. So you obviously can see the point there, how sexist that was. She just said, yeah, you know what? I, I know I'm good. And then she hired some men later as her associate, but she was the one who ran the office and she was the lead architect. She produced the last major accomplishment we'll say, and then we'll just briefly say what this building is and do the formal analysis, uh, is that she designed over 750 buildings. Now that you should write down because why is that of any relevance? Well, think about one architect doing that many, that should blow people's mind just that. Even if you know nothing about architecture, just that number. But here's how it compares to Frank Lloyd Wright. Frank Lloyd Wright had a, tw a career that was 20 years longer than hers, right? He started uh, earlier than she did. He was older, a generation older. So he had a career in which he designed an average of about 10 buildings a year and he totaled 550 buildings. That's pretty remarkable for a single architect who's not part of a big firm. It was his own office, right? Guess what? She only had a career that lasted 42 years. And she designed 200 more buildings than Frank Lloyd Wright. That's 18, sorry, 18 buildings a year she completed. Not just designed, but actually had built every year for her entire career. She, in other words, if you do it on the year by year basis, she outproduced Frank Lloyd Wright by two to one, twice as productive, twice as prolific is the phrase they use in architecture. Um, just a, a remarkable woman, obviously one of my heroes. And yes, she was the thesis subject for my master's thesis when I got my master's degree. Okay, so to wrap it up there on the meaning, this was the main house, I've already mentioned it, but what was inside it, if my gosh, I thought some people here had been to Hearst Castle, but if you ever go there, there's a guided tour and it's well worth it. It's about three hours or so, and you get to sit down and rest and there's refreshments. It's, it's, it's a nice, easy, uh, interesting afternoon or morning. I think they have tours from, 10 a.m. on. Uh, anyway, the point is that you'll see there, there's the largest dining room in California, at least at that time. And when this was built, it was the largest residential, I already said this, but I'll repeat it, the largest residential compound on the West Coast. Now it's overtaken by Bill Gates' compound up in Seattle, but I don't know if you've seen it. I actually got to go into the gate once with some real estate clients of mine who actually wanted to buy some land next to it. It's ugly. It's a concrete bunker architecture. Ugh. Anyway, some people like that. So this isn't any more. In other words, today it's the second largest residential compound on the West Coast, but still that's remarkable. But when it was built, it was by far and away the largest residential compound on the West Coast. There were a couple bigger ones on the East Coast. Pretty remarkable. Okay, let's do the formal analysis. Oh, it's Spanish colonial style. Yeah, the last fact about the meaning should be what style a building is in you know, architectural style is part of the meaning, of course. It's Spanish colonial revival, but there are Spanish Renaissance details. Now you might think, what's the difference? 
In Spain, there is even more ornate, if you ever get a chance to go both, as I have all over Mexico and all over Spain, you see the differences, they're, they're minor. But in Spain, their buildings from the 15 and 1600s, right, the Renaissance, are even more ornate than the ones from the same period. There are plenty of churches in Mexico that old, right? It's the oldest country in this hemisphere. Well, second oldest after Cuba. Um, anyway, so you'd see buildings similar to this in Mexico, but not this ornate. So this is really the correct term for the style, just to keep it simple and use one phrase, is a Spanish Renaissance revival with, with hints of Spanish colonial like Mexico would have. Okay, so let's do the formal analysis. The two towers for space, they're 165 feet tall. They're twin, of course, identical towers. Uh, okay, so the space is 55 feet thousand square feet, which itself should be rather impressive, right? I mean, this is one of the largest single buildings anywhere in California. Um, <clears throat> 55,000 square feet with over 50 rooms in it. So some of the rooms are a thousand, over a thousand square feet, of course. Uh, and then I think it has 15 bedrooms. I'm pretty sure that's right. Actually, in, including a couple in the towers, there's two bedrooms, one on each level of the upper portion of the towers, see all the way up there and here. So actually it's closer to 20, it might even be two dozen. So say around 20 bedrooms, a total of 55 rooms and 55,000 square feet of space with two towers totally a height of which are 165 feet. That's the real space. It's completely symmetrical left to right, of course, balanced side to side and unbalanced or weighted toward the bottom. The rhythm is obvious with, we'll go back up to the towers with the rounded, uh, you know, uh, cupolas, that's what those are, remember? At the top, I mean, I haven't used that word before. They're little rooms with a, you know, view of some kind. Cupolas, uh, that's, they're identical, of course. And then you have these bells here, right? In the bell towers and the arches and the windows, the brackets on this overhanging uh, balcony. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a porch in essence. That's the balcony from which Hearst, like Mussolini or someone like that, you know, from the European dictatorship would greet his guests. They would pull up in their limousines Oh, he had nonstop parties. Well, not nonstop, but constantly had parties during the warm months. That's what he built it for, was an entertainment center. It wasn't just to live with his uh, mistress, by the way it was, and uh, sometimes his five, he had five sons, and they sometimes came to stay here with him uh, after he and his wife separated. So the point is it was used both as his residence part-time. He had multiple residences all over California, and she designed three or four others for him too, by the way. But he mostly used it to entertain. And you can guess who he entertained, Charlie Chaplin, Cary Grant, Catherine Hepper, just about every famous actor and actress in Hollywood, as well as newspaper men and, you know, medium, other media types. Anyway, so then he, he, uh, he has this, this uh, design here, or she, she designed, and he asked her design. This, this, of course, creates rhythm, right? It's got brackets, projecting brackets, so there's a lot of rhythm, obviously, just multiple examples. And then it is both stable and dynamic, but more stable than dynamic because of the outer walls and the overall sort of rectangular shape of the main facade. But the towers, of course, end up with the curved, you know, you could say dome if you want, but that's not really the right word, the curved cupolas or tops. And then this is dynamic, this uh, overhanging uh, roof line here above the balcony. And, and so is the doorway. You'll see that, right? So there's a lot of dynamic detail, but the overall shape is stable. Uh, and then the largest mass is the central section, which I would call the, the entry pavilion or entry section, this section here. You see how it sticks in? So that's a separate uh, portion or mass of the building. Some would say the towers, you could, you could make that case each. It's hard to say for sure. So if you, why don't we go ahead and say probably by a notch, the towers, they're the same, of course, size or the same mass are the two largest masses, I guess. And then a close second would be the entryway, entry section. Okay, the colors cool on the blue tile on the towers and the white painted, it's painted concrete, by the way. Uh, and, and then warm on the um, red tile roofs and the wooden projecting beams. The textures are, are all are mostly real. You can see a little similar textures, but in this view, you won't have the close up, right? So it's, it's, he wanted two medieval knights in armor. That's kind of weird. That's what he asked for. So she did, had a sculpture designed that for those for him. 
but you can't really see that. So you could just say it's almost all real texture of smooth, and this is smooth concrete. Concrete can be either smooth or rough, but here it's very smooth. I walked along it and touched it. Uh, and then we have the smooth tile work on the roof lines and on the towers, smooth glass in the windows, and real rough texture of the wood overhanging uh, balcony there. <clears throat> Okay, and then there's the line. It's actually, you, you probably should say carved line because you can tell there's carved line around the doorway mostly and uh, on the beaming of the ceilings. And then uh, the line is mostly visual at the corners and the edges. And of course, the modeling is just the shadows from the sun on either side of this uh, and underneath the overhanging awning. I guess you call that an awning. Let's see, am I forgetting anything? Balance, rhythm, space. I think that's it, yeah. All right. This is the other Julie Morgan. And this one is actually, huh, and it's hard to say. It might be more better known to some of you. If you ever go down to Pacific Grove, anybody? Monterey, Carmel, Pacific Grove area. This is open to the public and it's well worth a visit. You don't have to have reservations. You can, you can stay at the place called Asilomar. So it's our next must know. Here we go. The architect's name again is Morgan, M-O-R-G-A-N, and it's Administration Building, Phoebe Hurst Social Hall. I'll accept either to give you a break if this is on the exam. I'm not gonna cut it from the study list. So it has at least a fairly good possibility to be on the exam. The other one may be I'm giving it a lot of clues and hints here about the, the final, even a higher percentage possibility of the Casa Grande, but this has, has some chance of being on the exam too. So we want to take the notes, of course, and study them. So again, I, I'll accept either just administration building at Sil Silomar. You do have to say where it is. If you just say administration building, then you could say at Silomar, and that's spelled A, capital A, of course, S-I-L-O-M-A-R, 1913. The other name for it is Phoebe Hearst Social Hall. I'm going to talk about who she was, part of the meaning here, of course. Phoebe is, as many people know, first name Phoebe, right? P-H-O-E-B-E, -E, capital P, of course, H-O-E-B-E. -E. Phoebe Hurst Social Hall, you could just say that and, and leave it at the at Silmar, right? That is the location, 1913. And of course, Julia is her first name, but you only have to remember her last name, Morgan. Okay, so why am I showing you uh, a building in a place that's kind of out of the way? Well, it's deliberately isolated or secluded, in other words, isolated sounds too extreme. So just say a secluded spot along the Pacific Ocean uh, near Monterey Bay. Technically speaking, it's south of Monterey Bay, but yeah, it's basically the same area. So you could say in the area around Monterey Bay, it's on the Pacific coast and it is a sheltered retreat for women is how it was designed. The original purpose, that's always a major part of the meaning of an architecture slide, along with who the architect was and what style. We'll get to that. We already talked about who she was, so we don't have to repeat that. But, but you know, what was the purpose of it is really the first fact you should have in your notes uh, besides the location. It was a YWCA camp or retreat with 13 buildings, all of which were designed by Julia Morgan in the early 1900s. So women, who had, you know, some need or reason they wanted to get away from, you know, the urban setting of the, or their family life or whatever, who were members of the YWCA could come here and stay. And of course, take classes, uh, you know, learn, learn about all kinds of things. Some of them were, were immigrant. Many of them were immigrant women who didn't speak much English. Julia Morgan was ahead of her time. She believed that most uh, large scale housing projects should have affordable, you know that phrase now, right? It's almost a cliche, you know, at least supposedly when new housing develops are built, some portion are set aside for lower income people. But that wasn't a concept back then, except for some religious groups and some architects. Uh, Maybach believed in that, but Julie Morgan did it everywhere she went. This includes some very affordable housing. And some of those women ended up working at this compound and then getting a career and learning how to become managers of social ev uh, you know, events or uh, for other women's groups. And it was a 
woman support system, if you want to call it that, that was headquartered here. And Phoebe Hearst is the reason it happened. That's why it's named for her. She was uh, William Randolph Hearst's mother, the wealthiest woman in America. Well, you can't say the wealthiest. That's hard to say back then. They, they didn't keep the records. Say one of the wealthiest women in the entire country was Phoebe Hearst. She was William Randolph Hearst's mother, but she was a lot more than that. She was a real woman's uh, equality advocate, a woman's rights missionary. I'd call her a missionary for women's equality. She hired Julia Morgan as the first client to hire Julia Morgan when she knew Julia Morgan had been a, a student at, at the college uh, where she gave money for the college. Santa, I'm talking about, of course, you see Berkeley campus. There are buildings named after her on the campus, by the way. They're named after her, not after, not after William Randolph, because she gave the money for them. Hearst Mining Building, Hearst Hall, and then another one, I think it's the gate. Uh, no, not that gate, that gate. The gate, the entrance to the campus, the old entrance that's some of you've seen on the news or you walked under it, big metal gates. That's actually paid for by one of her friends. But she paid for a lot of the campus buildings at UC Berkeley. And she was the one who hired Julie Morgan first to design a private home for her and her um, family. By this time, her son was already super wealthy. But anyway, she would became very important with the women's movement. She pushed for women's voting rights uh, and uh, women were able to vote in California. Do you know this? Before they were on national level elections, 1913, about the, the year this was open, they got the right to vote in state elections. And she was one of the people that pushed that for that reform. Yeah, so she wasn't just you know, an idle rich woman. Right? Uh, and she died of the 1918 flu epidemic, by the way. But she lived long enough to see at least most of the buildings at Asilomar uh, completed by Julia Morgan. And the other ones were finished in the 20s. So if you go there, it's like a, almost like, a, what's the word, an open air museum of early 20th century first. This is First Bay tradition. So that's the other part of the meaning. What style is it? How do you know? How do you describe it that, that way? Well, look at the materials. Natural materials, field stone, right? From right there, Carmel. In fact, it's from Carmel. The stone is mined just a few you know, miles away. Because <clears throat> this is, you know, Pacific, you, most of you know, right? Pacific Grove, Monterey, and Carmel are all contiguous. There are three cities that all join, you know, each other's city limits, <laughs> lining up with each other in Monterey County, of course. I think it's the most beautiful part of the state. Anyway, it's a very popular place. Now, what is it used for? It's no longer YWCA compound. I think that it changed hands after World War II. It's a, an international conference center where scientists, business people, professors, you know, educators, you could say it that way, right? Uh, politicians, people from all over the world come together and stay there for like a week or so at a time. You know, they have these international conferences. That's its most high end use, but it's also open to the general public. You can rent a room there for very reasonable, including breakfast. For, it was under $100 the last time I stayed there. It was $99, including a full breakfast in the dining hall that Julia Morgan designed within walking distance, a few steps of this building. But when you first get there, you go to this building to check in if you're staying overnight. You don't have to. You can just walk around and go in any of the buildings. Uh, you know, with discretion, of course, you wouldn't go upstairs in the residential halls and knock on doors. <laughs> Don't tell anyone I said you, sh you should be obviously discreet, normally discreet. But you're welcome into any of the buildings during the daytime anyway, at least. Anywhere on the, it's so beautiful. It's acres and acres. I don't even remember how many acres, maybe a couple square miles of total uh, land owned by the Silomar. And I've, I've talked to people in Europe, scientists in Europe who've been here, you know, even, you know, from Russia. <laughs> oh, Silomar, yes, I was there back in 1995 or something for a conference on, you know, global warming or whatever. It, it's a well-known site for among many professional groups around the world, not just in America. So the whole compound it is a compound. Remember a compound, I didn't define it, is what Hearst Castle was. Hearst Castle has 16 buildings. I should have said that with that slide. So I will go, now nah, let's not go back to it. Just you can add that if you have room and the, the energy to add one more line. I'm sorry about the last meaning of the last slide. That is only the largest building, that Casa Grande that we just saw the last slide. It's the largest building in a compound of 16 different structures. This is even larger. 
and it's not single family or, or some rich person's ego that, that is the driving force behind this. This is obviously meant to empower, and that's even what it says in their charter, empower women. Uh, to you know more independence freedom and and uh you know new new choices in their lives their careers and you know it was way before <laughs> women's liberation as a phrase or a concept was you know not yet common mainstream language but they, these people who built it phoebe hurst and julia morgan her architect as well as the women who ran it were already thinking that way of you know women being liberated from just the drudgery of no no choice but being you know housewives of course that's a choice anyone should feel free to make but uh, back then that wasn't there weren't many other choices unless you joined a group like this so then it uh it remained a women's center that's another way to put it you know at the ydbca kept this for decades afterwards and it functioned that way and then eventually it uh, transferred i think it was in the 50s it's owned by the state of california by the way i forgot to tell you that this 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 compound so on this compound it's even more there are even more buildings than there are at uh, hearst castle i believe it's over 20 of which julia morgan designed uh, actually i think it was eight 16 or so and 13 survived few of them the smaller ones have been torn down all the big buildings, the administration building, you're looking at it, the dining hall, there's a chapel for, you know, you don't have to be religious, you just go in and meditate. Uh, and then there's a, a performance hall for live theater. It's a really remarkable, self-contained community. Okay, let's wrap it up with the formal analysis and then I'll stick around and, and take questions because unless my calculations are right, yeah, these are for next week. Yeah, these are for next week. Okay. So yeah, because I promised you to end extra early. All right. Well, let's go ahead and keep the large view because you can see more of I think the detail. Formal analysis, the colors are all warm. I don't see any cool colors here. I mean, even on the roof, the tiles are not they're not tiles, they're they're shingles. The shingles are wood and that's a warm color. So the only thing somewhat cool is the metal framing. You could say that, a little bit of cool detail around the uh, picture glass windows. Look how modern those windows look too, for 1913. I'm sure the glass has been replaced maybe more than once over 108 years now. <laughs> but the actual framing and shaping, I mean, at least the placement of the windows, the design is original. Uh, beautiful inside too, by the way, this has got 20, for let's do the space it's one large open social hall uh right where you check in to you know your room and stuff or for your conferences and uh there's also you know refreshments and things like that at either end there's small rooms uh you know one set of offices on one end and a set of uh, you know gift shop on the other but mostly it's one long rectangular open hall uh with about a 22 foot high ceiling very impressive when you look up at it. Open beam ceiling, so that's the space. Uh, it is uh, balanced, totally symmetrical. She almost never did buildings that weren't. She didn't like asymmetry, you know, like Frank Gehry, that <laughs> she would have hated his stuff um, because she was taught at the school in Paris where that's what they taught, but also she just felt it was more pleasing aesthetically. So you stand in front of it, it is completely symmetrical left to right. And I would argue that you could draw the lines, whoops, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, if you draw the line about right here, you know, along the top of the windows where the wood meets the stone, it's roughly balanced top to bottom too. But because it's wider on the bottom, I wouldn't argue if, if you chose to say it looks unbalanced toward the bottom. It's a single mass. I don't really think you can break it down into separate sections. The textures are all real textures of rough wood you know, shingles on the walls and the, and the roof line. So real rough wood shingles, real rough stone walls, and real smooth glass in the windows. And of course the rhythm is obvious. The windows, the projecting beams, right? The roof lines all have these, right, peak gables. And then these windows are called dormers. You don't have to know that word, but the, the, those, there's, I think there's three on each side. So there's a lot of rhythm. It's dynamic on the roof line and pretty much stable everywhere else, isn't it? Almost all right angles. And there is visual line 
uh, around the windows and at the corners formed by the sunlight, which of course creates the modeling. Uh, it's not a technique for modeling, it's real modeling or natural modeling from the sunlight. Um, and then let's see, um, space, texture, I think I forget, oh, colors. I think I said, yeah, well, almost all warm colors, right? And then, um, I know there's one thing I think I'm forgetting here, balance. Um, no, it's, sta yeah, that's right. We covered it's mostly stable, uh, except for the roof lines. But everything else is now that's not typical of her work, although well, it is she, she did like a lot of stable lines. Uh, but she sometimes used dynamic details a lot of her larger well like the ones in her castle we just saw uh, has curved lines on the top of the towers or somewhere here she chose to make it rather kind of straightforward and uh, compact because the function of the building is that way it's it's, it's a one big open rectangular. Uh, meeting room, right, or, or sitting room. Quite literally, they're sitting, they're large open fireplaces, you can sit as long as you want in there, even if you're not staying there, and just watch the fires, the huge fireplaces with about 12 foot high openings, right? The fires are going until, I don't know, I think when they close the building around 11 at night. Uh, <clears throat> so it's well worth a visit. All right, I think we finished extra early, but I'm going to stick around if anyone has any questions. Now, let me go ahead and uh, do the stop sharing. I see there were 14. Uh, let's see, stop share. Yeah, that'll reduce. There we go. Okay, um, because we're down to what, three weeks? Well, including the exam, we only have two more weeks of lecture and review, of course, is the last lecture before the exam. Uh, for you to ask questions or otherwise clarify anything about extra credit, uh, that's why I stick around as always after the lecture to answer questions. So, so anybody here have any questions about your grade, uh, about extra credit? Yes. Uh, just one. Did we go over the five main movements of early modern architecture or is that for next week? Good point. That's why I like teaching in real time. Thank you, William. Um, you keep me honest. I meant to do that this week, but it's just as relevant next week. So I am going to make a note because of your helpful, timely reminder. Yeah, because that is the last. Yeah, second to because I jumped down to four main features. You got that right. A first page tradition, which we did. I, yeah. I have a feeling I was not alone, but I appreciate that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, it's not too late to do it next week because Three of them actually are coming up next week, but I will give you those. And, and the good news is for all of you who are still with us tonight or anyone watching this is a you know, video on YouTube after I post it by 8 p.m. on Friday as always, uh, is that you aren't, there aren't separate definitions. That'd be a lot more work for you to not only write them, but study and remember them and maybe be asked about them. I might say name two of the, or I might say two of the, main movements of 20th century or early, sorry, early modern architecture. I might do this. I might say are, um, let's say uh, first Bay tradition, true, right? And then I might say, um, let's see, postmodernism or, uh, you know, Frank Gehry style stuff, right? Uh, or, or space age, there is such a thing. The Space Needle in Seattle is considered space age architecture. So is the, the main airport at uh, the TWA terminal at the JFK airport. Um, th that wouldn't be. You'll have the list and all you'll be asked at most to do, if it's even on the final, the true false section will be to remember or look at your notes. Remember, it's an open book exam, of course, and uh, see if, if what I say about which of the examples I provide of those five movements are or aren't all part of that list. And it's only a list, in other words, but it's an important one. Thank you for reminding me. I do appreciate it, and I'm sure your fellow students will. So we'll start with that next week. We'll start with that because uh, I, I should do it now. People have already signed off, but that's very helpful. I will get to it. And it'll be, you'll see why it's its just as relevant next week. In fact, we have a few more slides to cover next week. So I think we'll probably still end a little early, but not quite as early as tonight. That's why I'm saying tonight's a good night to ask that kind of question or anything else about extra credit, your grades. Oh, the papers I'm already starting to work on grading, but give me till next week. I should be able to get them back maybe by the weekend, all of the ones turned in on time. 
And don't forget, if there's anyone out there that still hasn't turned in your second paper, if you can get them to me uh, by early morning hours, I'll say around 2 ish, 2 a.m. or so, or, or, or before that tonight or tomorrow morning, uh, they won't be counted as a week late. They'll be counted as just uh, you know less than seven days late, which means a difference of five points off uh, as opposed to 10 points deducted for lateness. So that might be an incentive for one or two people. All right, any other questions now? It's a good time to wrap up any loose ends. Of course, you can always email me about your grades as I've already done with people, about your total points and how many more points you need to get an A or whatever grade you aiming for. All right. Anybody else? Is that it? All right. See you guys all next week. Bye, Louise. <laughs> Take care. Did you have a question, Louise? You had one at the start, I thought. Did I answer all your questions? No. Uh, well, yeah, you did, but, but I don't have a question now. Okay, good. I just want to make sure because you always have such a good focus on, you know, things that help other students besides, of course, your own notes. Okay. Thank you, guys. We'll see you next week. Take care. Good night. Bye. Good night. <laughs>